before we get started, just a reminder that you can find all of my available rental properties on my website at markguzman.com. If you own investment property, click on the owner services section to see our complete list of services. Thank you to our sponsor for today's episode, East Brother Beer. Located on Canal Boulevard in Point Richmond, East Brother Beer mixes classic brewing styles with precision and modern sensibility to create the perfect Bay Area craft beer. We live in an era of breaking barriers. Men and women everywhere are taking on jobs that 20 years ago they never might have considered. Our guest on the podcast today is Sam Gubera. At 27 years old, she has already established herself as an elite level farrier. A farrier is a craftsman or craftswoman who trims and shoes the hooves of horses. It's not a job most people think about when it comes to working with horses, but it's an important job nonetheless. Today, Sam talks to us about what it means to be a farrier and how she broke into a field once dominated by men and taken it by storm. So, Sam, thanks for coming on to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate you coming out. And so one thing I like to start off with with each of my guests is basically ask you what's got your attention. It could be a book, movie, something, social media, political topic. What's got your attention right now? Um... I'm trying to box a little bit more in my spare time. So I like to box at night. I shoe horses by day and then train at night, which I haven't had much time for lately. So I'm trying to get in the gym a little bit more. Where do you um, box at? Um, right now I'm training at Pacific Ring in Oakland. Um, you like the gym? I love the gym. Yeah. My, my brother's a professional boxer too. Oh, professional so boxer. At, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So um, when I was a kid, we I did the horse thing and I was in martial arts, too. So both of those things kind of stuck with me okay. as an adult. So that's, that just comes natural for you then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. So, yeah. So boxing and I would like to um, get out of town more often. Yeah. Yeah. So that has <laughs> my think, attention, too. I think everyone would love to get out of town more often. Oh, dude, it's so hard. Yeah. yeah. What do you like about boxing? Um, I think it's really cathartic. It's a way to get a good cardio workout while not focusing on the workout, you know, like your, your mind is on a different task and then the workout just kind of comes by osmosis. So you're just focusing on the actual workout and just kind of letting everything else go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very cathartic. I forgot who we were uh, talking to a few episodes ago. Uh, we were talking about kind of like the same uh, subject, fitness and working out and how you just kind of – it's kind of like a form of meditation where totally. you just kind of zone out mm -hmm. and you just get into that workout. Totally. Yeah. So that's basically the same for you except boxing. Yeah. Yeah. So my job is a workout in itself, but then I just – I like boxing. I like yeah. Boxing now, I discovered you off of the San Francisco Chronicle. I yeah. also uh, saw you on Instagram, and I think I hit you up on Instagram the first time to invite you on the podcast. Did you grow up here in the Bay Area? Yeah, I grew up in Fremont okay. in the Niles District. How did you like growing up in the Bay Area? I loved it. I had an awesome childhood, great high school experience, just really awesome upbringing here. No, you're still here in uh, – are you still in Fremont? No, I actually live in Lafayette right now. Okay. But I bounce around a little bit. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I found you on Instagram through – it might have actually been through the San Francisco Chronicle Instagram mm -hmm. page. Mm -hmm. uh, they did an article on you and – basically what you do. So why don't you give us a uh, like a summary of farrier services and what you do and how you got into it? Yeah, so I'm a farrier, which means I shoe horses. I trim and shoe. <clears throat> um, someone's got to do it, right? I know it's a super random job, but um, I used to ride when I was little. Um and all throughout, you know, high school and growing up. And when I was in college, I sold my horse, truck, trailer, and was just traveling a little bit. I moved to Boston even. Um, and then I was like, you know what? I miss the horse thing. And I called my, my farrier that I was using before. And one phone call led to going to the same school that she went to, um, which led to an apprenticeship and just... The rest is history, you know? That's how it started. Yeah. So you, you grew up riding horses then? Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually the only person in my family that's into it. It's just that when I was a kid, my mom 
wanted me to be involved in something. So she put me in like basketball, gymnastics. Okay, let's try horseback riding. And I wouldn't get off kind of a thing. So, okay. she, yeah, my family was supportive. But I'm the, I was the only one that was like, okay, I'm doing this now, yeah. you know. <laughs> so. so you had a horse. You contacted the farrier that you were using. And that's how you got the introduction into that occupation. Yeah, she was just like, oh, I went to this school. So I applied to go to that school. and So I, there's an actual school for it. Yeah, it's in um, – the one I went to is in Plymouth, California, which is near Sacramento. Like no one knows where Plymouth is because there's nothing really there. <laughs> um, but I actually did not have a good time at the school. By that I mean um, – okay. So – when I went to the school, I had only ever ridden horses. I didn't know anything about shoeing. I'd never been under a horse, didn't do an apprenticeship, nothing. So when I went there, I was totally new to that whole realm. And I didn't even graduate. Like, I wasn't very good at it at first. Um, they really focused a lot on, like, hand-making the shoes, which no one does anymore. It's almost like if you're a baker and they're like, okay, you have to churn your own butter. You know, like, no, yeah. it, like, you can do that if you want, but it's not necessary. Um, so I didn't even graduate, but I called a guy called Steve Weiberg when I was done with the school. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to give it another try. He took me under his wing for two months, and I went back to that same school and then graduated top of that next class. So after going with him, I learned everything I needed to know. It was a totally different experience. Um... And I just had a great time doing it. He he really taught me everything that I needed to know. And I remember after the first day I went with him, I was very nervous, no confidence at all. Um, and then so we finished the first day. You know, I'm doing everything he tells me to do. And he's like, so are you with us tomorrow? And I was like, well, I don't know. And he's like, that doesn't answer my fucking question. <laughs> are you with us tomorrow or not? And I was like, okay, sure. And then... You know, I worked with him for a few years, and it was me and him and another guy. And uh, we were like a well-oiled machine. And we got under We did two horses at a time, usually. Like, I I learned pretty aggressively. So two through. horses at a time, but how many could you do in a day? <sighs> if they, So it depends, right? Because sometimes if, we're, if we have a horse that just needs a trim um, that doesn't require shoes, that only takes like 10 minutes. So we could bust out. You know, like over 20 of those, easy. Um, if they required full shoeings, maybe like 16. So it okay. just depends on like what we needed to do. But we, we could do a lot, a lot of horses. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. So so what's the process like? So someone comes to you with their horse. They want it shoed or uh, trimmed. I mean – how much do those services cost and what's the process as soon as the horse arrives? So when someone calls me um, and says that their horse needs shoes, I come out, look at the horse, introduce myself to the horse. You know, the clients really like it when you are friendly and take your time and you're patient with their with their baby, right? <laughs> So, now, is um, every horse coming to you, like, fully trained, or are there some wild horses? A little of both. A little of both. So there are some that I need to take a little more time with, and then most of them are kind of with the program. Because usually when they're, when they're very little, you want them used to their feet being handled, right? Because they're going to get to a point where they're big. They're a lot bigger than you, obviously, and if they don't want to deal with you, then... They're bigger than you. It's going to hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So we try to get them dialed in um, as early as possible. But um, the first thing I do is I pull the shoe off. I uh, take away all the dead sole. I trim it. It's just like getting a pedicure. So I trim the excess. Their, their nails, pretty much. I'm just trimming their nails. Um, and then I say, okay, this horse looks like it's a size whatever the size is, and I have my inventory of horseshoes, different sizes, shapes, kinds, and um, all their feet are different. So I put it on the anvil, shape it up, smoke the shoe on, which is a process where we heat the shoe up and we bring it over to the foot and kind of sear it to get that perfect marriage between the shoe and the foot. Um, 
cool it off, grind it up, nail that sucker on, and they're good to go for so you, six to eight weeks. So you have to sear it onto the actual <sighs> foot? Yeah. So would that be kind of similar to like um, getting like a retainer where they have to mold it to your exact mouth? I guess kind of. So that it fits perfect? Yeah, I guess you could kind of say that. It it um, It's not a totally essential part of the process. Like there's a lot of guys that just do called it's called cold shoeing where they just shape the shoe cold and then they tack it on cold which that's fine there are some horses that can't deal with the smoke billowing out from under them which you can't blame them right even though it doesn't hurt them it's like okay well what's all this smoke coming yeah. from underneath me right most of them get used to that once they realize okay I'm not in any pain but some of them that are just a little bit more flighty I just have to do them cold so I was just in uh, Vegas, I was telling you, for basically real estate classes, but my business partner flew out there on the weekend because he was going to a horse show. He just recently got into buying uh, buying show horses, mm -hmm. and I guess they had a big, giant competition where people bring their show horses to do, like, dancing, like oh, dancing yeah, yeah. horses, and then people will go and they flip them. They, yeah. they buy horses, they win a few competitions, and then sell them off to people who want to keep them. And these are not race horses, just simply show horses. Mm -hmm. And so have you dealt with many of those show ho horses? And does, it, does your business have to change or modify to adapt for these, I guess, special horses? Yeah, I do different things for different horses. Um, I mostly do eventers and dressage horses, which I think that's what you're talking about when you say dancing. I think you're talking about dressage. But there's okay. a couple different avenues of, like, dancing because then you've got, like, the Mexican dancing horses. You've got some gated horses that look like they're dancing. But I think you're probably talking about dressage. Okay. So. Okay. Different process with them? Just maybe extra careful? Or it's still the it's... same process usually. Um, sometimes I'll stick them in a different kind of shoe, like maybe a rolled toe or something like that, which is hard to like just say it and expect you know what I'm talking about. So what's, a rolled, what's a rolled toe? It's like you have the horseshoe, and then it's, it's almost like beveled at the toe so they can break over a little bit easier. Okay. You know? Okay. I, I can see that because they do quite a bit of that in – those routines. Yeah. 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 Where they just kind of, especially when they're posing a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So in your early days when you first started, I mean, it sounds like you were really nervous getting oh into God. it. Yeah, I was. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but then, like I said, the guy that taught me everything, Steve, it's just, okay, it's simple. Make a decision. Make a decision. So he kind of just broke me of that. You know, because a lot of it really is simple. I mean, it's like with anything else where just the longer you do it, I don't really need to think about it so much anymore. Even if there is something that's, okay, here's a problem I need to fix, I just kind of know how to fix it without really thinking about it, you know, and I've mm -hmm. gotten pretty comfortable. And at what point did you go out on your own to do it? I think I was with Steve for about three years, but I was working with him for at least five days a week. He was working seven days a week. He's out of his mind. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, like I said, I was just pretty aggressive about my education. So I went with him and I went with several other farriers, too, just to see, you know, what they're doing. What are you doing differently? Because there's not just one way to do it. You know, Can you elaborate on that? There's different styles to do it. So, um like the way you shape the shoe or different kinds of shoes, they're, different people do it a different way. Um, as long as you get the same-ish result, there's a hundred ways to skin a cat. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like when you see someone doing so, oh, he's doing it that way. Well, what an idiot. Okay, well, he's not an idiot if it works. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Now, would it be, would you do it a different style if it's maybe... Um, a show horse or a regular riding horse compared to, let's say, a race horse? Yeah, well, actually, I've never shot. I've shot a few horses off the track that are retired. Um, but I think the racetrack uses resident farriers. Like, they have guys that come okay. on there. that They're kind of designated for all those horses. But I, I don't really work on any. So, So when you went out on your own, was it – pretty easy for you to build your business or was it pretty difficult at, at first? 
I think it was difficult at first because I'm young, right? Like, I'll, normally farriers are older. I feel like every farrier I've ever known is just, like, an older, seasoned dude, right? So <laughs> I just, I don't have the farrier look about me. So when I first started showing up to do people's horses, it's like, okay, like, who is this girl? You yeah, know? that was an article written about you that you were the only female in the Bay Area doing this because it's a really male-dominated world. Yeah. Or no, there, there's a few other um, women in the Bay Area that do it, um, but definitely it's male dominated. You know, you're swinging a hammer for a living. So, um, but I, you know what though, I don't feel like my gender has gone against me at all. Like I've never, I haven't felt any resistance um, by any of my male counterparts or anything like that. So. So even if it's even if, even though right now it's a male dominated industry, you never felt any pushback. Yeah, no one ever said like, "Oh, you can't do this," or I've never been like scoffed at or anything, nothing like that. Are they just excited to have a girl finally doing it? Or? <laughs> maybe, maybe they're like, "Hey, like, <laughs> I'm not mad at this." Um, but I mean, even though I am a girl, like you would expect. I guess maybe someone more butchy looking. Like, I definitely have a look about me that's not, that doesn't fit under the farrier category. Like, some people are su surprised. So you say when there's they other women that are also doing this in the Bay Area, right? Yeah, not many, but there's a few. What's a, what would you say the ratio is? I don't know, like one out of 10 at, okay. the, at the most, like maybe even less than that. So like, five, 10%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, what do you think that is? Just. Um, you know, I don't know. I'm, sh I'm sure there's a lot of like science behind it, but it's the same thing as like, how come there's not that many like women construction workers? Because in this day and age, I don't think there's a lot of people that are saying like, oh, you can't do that. I think that our interests might just be different. Right. Like, mm -hmm. some, like, I don't know, some people might be mad that I'm saying that, but. I think women have different interests a lot of the time. So. Yeah. Yeah. So working with horses, I mean, that's got to be a lot of fun for you. I mean, like, what's, for you, what's what's been the most fun about working with horses? Um, I think I'm just really comfortable with it. I like that I just, I know what I'm doing. I never feel nervous or I'm never second guessing myself. I'm very in my zone when I'm around them. And yeah. I bet they all have personalities, right? Yeah. Oh definitely. They definitely do. Like I, I have some that are like my oh my favorite clients and you know they kind of mess with me when I'm working on them. Like they'll kind of put their mouth on <laughs> so me and stuff. So you refer to the horses as your clients? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So so you can tell personalities. They're, they're like people's like dogs and cats that have yeah. their own personalities. Too. Yeah. And then, like I said, sometimes you get some that are a little bit more sensitive. Those are the ones that kind of make me a little uneasy because horses aren't mean. They're never going to. I shouldn't say never, but generally they're not going to try to bite you or lash out at you. Um, it's just that if they get scared, you don't want to be in their way. If they get scared of something, you know, you just need to be ready to get out of the way at any time. So what are some of the safety measures that you have to take to make sure that you don't get hurt? You just need to be aware of your surroundings. Like when I get to a barn, OK, this is over here, this is over here and just the kind of horse you're working on. If I know the horse pretty well and they're always pretty bomb proof, you know, they don't really care about what I'm doing. Um, I can be a little bit more relaxed, but anything can happen. You still need to be on your toes. Whereas if I see a horse that's wide-eyed and snorting at the wind and just kind of dancing around a little bit, I'm like, okay, I just need to get be ready to drop the foot and get out of the way if anything happens. Okay. Yeah. Now, I, I would imagine they they can, I know they can kick really hard, but do they sometimes use their neck and their head to kind of swing around and hit things? Not intentionally. They can, but it, it wouldn't be intentional. They might, like, I mean, I've kind of bumped heads with a horse before who was just, like, looking at something, mm -hmm. you know? So, again, you're just kind of in their way while they're doing something. So you said it's like trimming their nails mm -hmm. uh, when you do what you do. 
why horseshoes? I mean, why do horses really need horseshoes? That's like the, the question I get asked the most often. And the answer is, so not all of them need shoes. Um, in the wild, they're born on rough terrain and then they're ambulatory for their whole life. They're out walking on hard terrain and they're able to just develop naturally. Whereas now we're breeding horses, keeping them on lush ground. We're putting them in a stall and then taking them out, throwing a saddle on and saying, jump over the six foot fence. So genetics play a part. Development plays a huge part. Um, so some horses just wear shoes in front. Some are barefoot. Some need them all the way around. It just depends. I try to keep horses barefoot till they're at least like three. And even then it's like, okay, well, let's put shoes on the front if they're really wearing the shit out of their feet. Just depending on what the what they're being used for. You know? Okay. That's interesting because I always I always thought about that. Like, why do horses need horseshoes if you have wild horses mm -hmm. that there's no one there, you know, putting horseshoes on Totally. Them? Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. So yeah. they grow up in tough terrains. They're able to build up their, sh their feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you call them feet or do you We call them, do. You? I mean, yeah. So you can call them hooves, but. Hooves, yeah. They're... But we, we, like, all the farriers or even vets will be like, okay, well, look at the feet. You know, it's not abnormal to say that. Yeah. Okay. yeah it sounds weird, but that's how we say it. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, are there a lot of areas in North America where you just have wide ranges of wild horses? I would assume some national parks, but... I think like Montana probably and Wyoming and all that. But to be honest, I don't even really know where the most of them are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a lot of the... Now, so you make essentially house calls or do you have an area where people bring horses to you? Uh, back in the day, it was like that where a farrier would have a shop and people would bring their horses to them. But now we do it house call way. So I put a lot of miles on my truck every year for sure. I spend a lot of time on the road. So what's the area that you cover? So I'm kind of split in half. So um, I'm pretty much all over the Bay Area. Half of it is Lafayette, Martinez, Castro Valley, Pleasanton, Oakland Hills. And then the other half is Woodside, San Jose, kind of South Bay and Peninsula. I go up north too to Pacifica and Daly City. Um, which sounds insane, but if you group all the horses together and you have a whole day of work in any of those places, it's worth the drive. So. Now, do you have a horse yourself? No. Do you plan to have one one day? I do, yeah. I mean, I've owned them before, and I would like to own them again. It's just right now, I don't have a home yet. That's my, like I don't own a home yet, so I want to get that out of the way before I – Drain all my money. <laughs> oh, my God. It's going to drain all my money when I get one. But So you want a home with uh, basically a stable? Uh, that would be cool. I'd like to at least get, like, an investment property. It doesn't necessarily need to be that kind of a place yet because I wouldn't mind boarding the horse somewhere. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So if you don't have a house, you can still buy a horse and board it somewhere, right? Totally. Yeah, that's what most people do. Okay. Yeah. And then – I mean, do you, do you still do, I assume you do a lot of writing still today, right? I do. I, you can. Yeah, I have a couple of clients that are like, oh, I know you can ride. Like, here, here's the key to my tack box. I never have time to ride my own horse, so. Yeah. Now, what does a horse cost? I mean, I, I know they uh, vary in range, and my business partner was saying, well, he just bought one for 50000 but <laughs> But they plan. Yeah, 50000 that's like, that's like not unheard of at all. It's like I work on some that are worth more than my head. So so he bought it for fifty thousand. His plan is to flip it for a hundred thousand. And he his business partner that is also in into buying uh buying horses just bought one for like five hundred thousand. And the show that they were at in Vegas had twenty million dollars worth of horses. Is, it was is ridiculous. Flipping a horse like a real thing? Yeah. Like yeah. The only thing that makes me nervous about horse flipping is that I feel like for as they're big animals, but they're fragile. If that horse, there's a lot that could go wrong health wise or just lameness wise. And if something happens to them, like you're fucked. Yeah. You know, 
they're worthless now, pretty much. Yeah, it, it's definitely a gamble. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge gamble because, yeah, if something happens, then your 50000 is down the drain. Totally. And now you might be selling it for five or 10000 mm-hmm. I mean, What are you yeah, doing then that, that flips the horse? I mean... Some people will buy them, and then it's the training that you're paying for. Like, you're paying for, like, the horse and the bloodlines and the confirmation and all that, but then after that comes the training. And then maybe if after they've won several shows, then you're paying for, like, oh, look at the history kind of a thing. So I would never spend that much money. Even if I had the money, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> yeah, his, his business partner bought one, I want to say, for... 50, 60,000. They ended up winning a few competitions. Yeah. And then after that, they ended up selling it for, I want to say it was like 250,000, something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, Good for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so he made a lot of money. So he's done it uh, probably four or five times. And now my business partner, he's jumping into that world uh, just to kind of give it a try because he's all, all about, well, where can I invest my money? And if I have a little bit of extra money to invest, he's got no problem doing something high risk like that because yeah, you could lose all your money or recoup maybe 5,000, but what's the average cost for a horse? Like not a show horse, but. Not a show horse, okay. Um, it's so hard to say average because you get those kind of numbers all the way down to like, okay, free, and they're still rideable and like they just need to be rehomed. Um, but I'd say average for like a solid, like a very solid horse that's broke, I don't know, like five to 7,000, maybe 10,000. Now, when you say broke, you're talking about trained. Oh yeah. Broke. Yeah. Trained. What's the training process like for a horse? How long does that take? Um, usually when people send their horses to training, they could do, um, like a 30 days under saddle or 90 days under saddle. And that's just to get kind of dialed in and then after that you could do more extensive training for like for years it's it's almost like a never-ending process now horses are pretty smart right not really <laughs> <laughs> no they are they are i wouldn't say they're like as smart as a dog but they're smarter than cows kind of a thing they're, okay. they're smart they ish, yeah. <laughs> ish. <laughs> now how many different i know there's a lot of different breeds of horses yeah and there's got to be a huge difference in personalities and strengths and pros, cons between each of the breeds. What's your favorite breed that you like to work with or that you would like to own one day? So my favorite breed to work with, I think, are Arabians because they get, they let you – they're pretty limber. And you could pull their leg out a little bit easier. They're pretty flexible. So my job is actually feels easier with them. And I think they have the best personalities that I've seen. I went to a Circuit Soleil show in San Francisco, the traveling one that they had. Uh And they did one with horses. And they had something like 100 Arabian horses. They had a total of like 125 different horses. But 100 of them were Arabian horses that they trained. And it was a great show. I mean, just... They even, they had this tent. They even flooded the entire uh, uh, stage with like a few inches of water, having them run through. And nice. yeah, it was a cool show. Yeah, when I get another horse, though, I'll probably do like a quarter horse or a quarter horse cross. Because um, I used to rodeo. Now, back what do you in the mean? What school. do you mean by a quarter horse cross? So a quarter horse is. Um, if you, if you've seen a rodeo that that's what they're using most of the time is a quarter horse. They got the like the horses you would rope on and everything like that. Those are quarter horses and they run the quarter mile the fastest. That's why they're called that. Okay. When you see a horse race, they use thoroughbreds cuz they do the full mile, but then quarter horses run. They're they're sprinters. They're the sprinters and they're stocky. They're built. Okay, so yeah. you're looking you would ideally be looking for a quarter horse. Or quarter horse cross, yeah, something like that. An Arabian. Maybe. Yeah. I just like to, you know what, now, like, I used to compete in rodeos when I was in high school, but now I just want something that I could take camping or just take up in the hills and, you know, maybe do arena work sometimes, but I wouldn't be interested in doing any competitions now. There's a few people a here, in, uh, we're here in Pinal, and mm-hmm. it's a pretty small town, but there's a few people here that have uh, ranches and horses, and every now and then you see them uh, riding their horse up and down Pinot Valley Road. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a few people ride down to the bar, get a drink, and then ride back Hell home. Hell yeah. I'm glad that's still. 
I'm glad that's still going on. Yeah, and speaking of beer, how do you like the East Brother Beer Company up here? I really like this beer. Yeah, they're in. Yeah. Uh, they're over there by Point Richmond, so yeah. tucked away in warehouses. So very cool spot to go to. I like their beer. This is one of their newer ones too. Yeah, it, yeah. For a lager, I mean, it, it has a really good flavor. I like it. Yeah, it's good. So you used to compete in uh, rodeos. Mm-hmm. So, what do you compete in in a rodeo? So I used to do barrel racing which is where they have the three barrels set up in like a triangle and you do, it's called a cloverleaf pattern. It's just a timed event. And then I was roping too. I was doing team roping. Okay. Um, But yeah, barrel racing is the girls event. Like girls can team rope, but boys aren't allowed to do the barrel racing. That's just like strictly the event for chicks, you know? (laughs) (laughs) So on barrel racing, I mean, what are... I know you said it's a time event, but there's got to be a lot more that goes into just having a fast horse, right? Yeah. I mean, what are the techniques you have to learn and use to make it like a good run? So there's different techniques. Like you want to get like a deep pocket. Like you want to get the tightest turn that you possibly can without knocking the barrel over. So you would make like a big pocket and then Mm -hmm. cut the turn really close instead of cutting it close and then coming out Mm -hmm. wide. So sorry for everyone that can just hear me because I'm like doing the pattern with my finger and you can't see. But um, yeah. I mean, I mean, um, I guess what I'm trying to find out is what techniques. I mean, as a rider, you're on the horse. What are you doing in the middle of this run to make sure that the horse is cutting these uh, corners pretty tight? It's all in the hips. It's all like seat movement and kind of pulling them around. Um, So you want to like keep your weight to the outside and then put it to the inside. And you're kind of talking to them through your body movement and with your hands too, like with the reins. Uh, But that that should come secondary, like your little secondary guide. Now with the horses, I, I mean, obviously if you're competing, you've already practiced with them multiple times, Mm -hmm. many times doing that same routine. It's got to come second nature uh, to them, right? Yeah. I mean, just natural for them to just, they know exactly what they're supposed to do. Right. Yeah, so they know. I mean, you you really are just kind of sitting there for the ride at that point. But it's all the training that you've done that's kind of like showing through in the competition. Now, what about roping? How difficult is that? Um, it looks a lot easier than it is. I mean, it, <laughs> again, it's one of those things that after you do it so many times, it like becomes easier. But um yeah, roping was more fun for me. I liked it a lot. So pretty much I would be, I was a header. So that means um, we'd back into the box, into the gate, and I'd be on the left side. The steer would be on the middle. And then to my right would be my partner. They're called a healer. And they're on their horse with their rope. They let the steer out. And so we're running down the arena on either side of the steer. I roped the horns. Da- it's called dallying, but pretty much tie it to the horn of the saddle and turn left. And then the healer follows and ropes the heels up. And then the steer does a little midair kind of stretch, and then that's when the timer goes off. Okay. Sounds a little cruel, but it's really not. It's like, it's fine. <laughs> and that happens just I mean, within seconds, right? Oh, yeah. Like, all the really good guys are getting, like, three seconds. Wow. Like, three seconds of all that stuff. So, I mean. What was your best time? <sighs> Yeah, I actually never competed in that, so we never really timed it. We just, like, did it for fun. But I'd say probably, like, my best time doing that was, like, eight seconds maybe at, like, my very best. Wow, and so some of the uh, people are getting three seconds. Yeah, it's crazy. Wow. Wow. So how do you learn? I mean, you're talking about roping, and it looks easy, Yeah. but it's really not easy. I mean, how do you learn how to throw the rope and then tie something. So they have, like, these little roping dummies. So it's just a little fake. I mean, sometimes they have metal ones, sometimes plastic ones. I've seen, like, the little barrels like and they put, dummies. like, horns yeah. on it. And then yeah, it's on a string that just flies right across. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So you just do that over and over and over and over again. <laughs> you get really frustrated and then you get good at it. Is there a technique to the rope? Uh, yeah. I'd say, like, you have to keep your elbow high. 
and uh, keep. I, I say for me, I was keeping everything too tight. Like when I was first trying to learn, I was too tight. You need to kind of keep everything loose and flowing. So, okay. Yeah. Now, um, have you, like, as a farrier, have you gone outside of the country and done jobs out there, or is it not yet? Just... But I probably will later on. Okay. Yeah. It'd be a great way to travel. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So how do you market your business? So I have, when I first started, it was just word of mouth, just talking to people. Even like Steve uh, would kick me clients that he didn't have time for, um, posting my business cards at different ranches. And I remember when I first started like pulling up to different barns and just introducing myself to the barn owner, like, hey, I'm Sam, like I'm a farrier. Uh my website has helped a lot. I have a Yelp page. You get quite a few people off Yelp? Yeah. I, I've had a lot of people contact me through Yelp, which is odd, right? Like, I didn't think, yeah. oh, Farrier on Yelp, but it, it happens. Um, Google. Yeah, I think Yelp is huge, especially here in the Bay Area. I mean, whenever I need something, that's my first go-to spot. Anything. Yeah. Yeah. So that's helped me. And, yeah, just Google, honestly. And word of mouth. Word of mouth and Google have been the two best. So, so um, your website, that's helped you out quite a bit. Yeah. And do you spend quite a bit of money on that website? Not too much. I use uh, Squarespace and just kind of built it myself, and it's like, it works. Yeah. <laughs> it's got all the, here's some pictures, and here's my phone. But the memory. website works. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've got, um, I do another sub-series on the podcast here where it's really just all about real estate. Yeah. And there's a lot of real estate agents that don't have websites. And I, I keep telling them you have to get websites because it helps. And it's just simple SEO. And it, it's any business. Mm -hmm. You know, any business can benefit from a website. And that's a good example. Right. And I get a lot of comments on like, oh, I can't believe you have a website. Like, you you must be the only farrier with a website. Really? Well, th they're, that is they're like becoming... Real <laughs> yeah. They are becoming more popular, but it's just... Maybe it's because the older guys are so dialed in that they're like, okay, well, I have all the clients I could, I need. I have too many clients. Like, why do I need to advertise with the website? But I made mine pretty early on when I was still really hungry for people, yeah. you know? So Now, do you see more and more of the public getting into owning horses and more and more people needing that service? Or do you see it, do you see people getting away from maybe horse ownership? Um, I've seen a lot of horse people like leaving the state just because it's California. Like people are tired. Just of pricey. The, expensive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but in terms of just interest, I, it's still there. What I have been seeing is that there's less farriers though. Like people have been more hungry for people like me. So that's good. What do you charge? Um, it depends on the area a little bit. Um, but my base rate is 190 for a full set. That includes the horseshoes and everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, what are you looking long term with your business? I mean, what's your ultimate goal in five years or 10 years? So in five or 10 years, I'd like to own a couple investment properties. Uh, and I'd like to. We sell investment properties here. Huh? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We'll talk after the podcast. Um, but I'd like to still be shooing. Like, I, I love it. I really enjoy it a lot. I feel like if I won the lottery and didn't need to shoe anymore, I'd still kind of miss it, which is awesome. Like, working, I earn every single penny. It's a backbreaking job. But I think the pros outweigh the cons, especially for someone like me. So just being your own boss, like, there's nothing like it. I've, you know, my whole life I've had bosses, like teachers, bosses, all this. And I guess your clients are your boss, but you have so many that it's like you don't need to answer to just one person every day. And Correct. So that's, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. If you really can't. And that's one thing like for business owners, many people, especially like new business owners. Yeah. You get stuck into this um, idea that you have to say yes to everyone mm -hmm. or you have to comply to every client's request. And you come to find out after a few years that that's not really the case. Yeah. There's usually enough business out there. And if you can't really work with someone, you need to fire them as a client. Yeah. I've done it before. I, I haven't done it a lot because I'm, I'm really easygoing. 
and there's a lot of things. It's like, oh, don't farriers hate it when you do this? And I'm like, yeah, like, I don't really care. But um, I've only had, had to fire a couple people. And usually it's because it's like, okay, well, the horse is really dangerous and you don't want to drug it or train it. So I don't have time for this. You know, I don't want to. Yeah. Because if I get hurt, I'm just, I'm screwed. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's your livelihood. Yeah. Yeah. So, so actually, speaking of that, just real quick, someone stole my trailer that I work out of. What? Um, not recently, but it's just kind of like a cool story. So on election <laughs> night, I, I was living in Oakland at the time. Um, in a gentrified area was, I wasn't living in like, <laughs> I wasn't living in like a shithole. Um, but it was right on a uh, 58th and telegraph. And I used to park in front of this hospital. Um, cause we didn't have a driveway. So I'd park in front of the hospital. <clears throat> cause there's surveillance footage of someone coming on election night and unhooking my trailer and driving off with it. Wow. And my, so again, my trailer is my workshop. Like you open it up and all my tools, everything swings out. My forge, ex grinders, like everything. Um, and it's a little six foot aluminum trailer. It's not one of those white cargo trailers where they're a dime a dozen. Um, it's pretty unique looking. My anvil's on the back of it, like on the outside. It says Sam's Horseshoeing <laughs> on it. And wow. uh, yeah, so they just took off with it. Yeah. And so it was gone for three months and I was totally like losing my shit just trying to manage without my work space like steve let me borrow his whole rig for like a couple times just to catch up on work and another farrier out in brentwood saw that our stolen trailer ad on craigslist he was just on craigslist and just happened to see it and he was like oh i drive by that every day <laughs> wow <laughs> it's on somebody's uh like it's it, he said it's on some shady horse trading property where no one lives there but th it, there's a barn with horses there and there's people coming in and out of there all the time um so i went with the sheriff and went and picked it up they were using it so all my shit was in there they tried wow. to scratch the the number off but i still work out of it every day i got it back and i'm stoked but just wow I'm glad to hear you got it back dude but... i never thought i was gonna see that thing again after like the first week i was like oh, okay I mean, you, you, don't, you don't hear that quite often. <laughs> no, but it's just like, look out for each other. Farrier's uh, yeah. trailer gets stolen <laughs> I know, dude. in Oakland, too. I know. And, like, I was so done. So, again, this is just like, oh, I'm in my 20s and naive about things getting stolen. Um, I didn't have insurance on it. Now I have insurance on everything. My dog is insured after that experience. So yeah. I learned some lessons. Skin's a little thicker. Um, so, yeah, don't leave your stuff unlocked. Yeah, we country. had an insurance agent, actually a few here on the show. And, yeah, it's one of those things they say it all the time. Like, many times you feel you don't need the insurance, but when something happens, you're thankful that you have the insurance because Dude. most of the time it will cover it if you're properly insured. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so it's true. So. Glad to hear that you got it back. Yeah, dude. I mean, the fat, if not for that other farrier in Brentwood on Craigslist that night or whatever. You would have never found just, it. I would have never found it. It's so Maybe. trippy. Yeah. So just good looking out. Like, shout out to him. And yeah, just people looking out for each other. Yeah. You know? So, so in five to 10 years, you want to own rental property. Yeah. Investment property. Yes. What about your business? Do you? Do you plan to keep growing the business or is your goal to eventually just have investment property to where you can then just ride horses and do what you want to do instead of that? Yeah. Like, because again, I love my job. I love, I love it. I don't want to quit doing it, but there we, as a farrier, I have a shelf life, right? Like we're bent over 90% of the time. And uh, so it's tough on your back then. It's really tough on your back, well, just and your body, you know? So I, there's going to be a point where I'm too mangled to really like want to work that much anymore. Like maybe I'll do like a few horses a day versus however many I'm doing right now, but I'm going to need what are to you cut doing it right back. Now? If I'm at the same place every day uh, and they're all full shoeings, I can maybe do like 10 at the most, like eight to 10 at the most. Um, but, like, I have an account where it's just a shitload of trims, and I did 20 plus a front shoeing. And I'm still, like, dead at the end of the day, but it just depends. Because the 
the driving is a lot too. If I have to go to three different places and I have to go there, set up, do it, pack up, drive to the next place, then it just takes more time. Okay, and you're tra- taking your trailer this entire time to each yeah, place. Yeah, yeah. I never even I never unhook my trailer from my truck because I work so much that I just I have a little get around car for when I need to run errands and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So. Definitely talk to us. We'll talk to you about buying investment property because that's literally what we specialize, what we do here. Hmm. So you live in Lafayette. What's your favorite restaurant to eat there? Okay. I feel like, like, sorry to Lafayette people, but I think so far the food scene is a little weak (laughs) (laughs) that I've seen. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. Like, I haven't been to every place, but I've only been living in Lafayette for like a year, a little less than a year. So I haven't been to every single place. But I will say... Bay Area wise, I really like Vans, the Vans restaurant in Belmont. Have you been there? No, I haven't. Hell of good, best filet mignon I've ever had. Really? In my life. Yeah. Is it a steakhouse? Um, I wouldn't call it a steakhouse, but it's kind of like an old school feel. Like it's been there for a really long time. My mom was like, "Oh, my, your grandma used to go to Vans, <laughs> you know." And it's it's up on a hill in a residential neighborhood. Okay. But it's kind of like got a fifties feel to it. Okay. But yeah, if I get filet mignon anywhere else, it's I'm like outraged. That reminds <laughs> like, since going there, yeah. That reminds me a little bit of uh, Joe's of Westlake. Uh huh. Have you ever been there? Uh huh. So that's right on the border of uh, Daly City. Yeah, right over there in the peninsula. But anyway, Joe's of Westlake. Okay. Uh, it was even featured on that Bay Area show. Like top uh, top restaurants, and they do like a review of uh, various different restaurants uh, in the Bay Area. And so, you go there. So many people rave about it, but yeah. uh, it's kind of like um, what's that restaurant, uh, Buttercup Grill, or like a Lions? Like yeah, to- totally like just a, a diner. lot of it's just a diner. A lot of people remember it being the best in the 50s and 60s, yeah. yet you still have, like, those patrons or patrons still visiting there. Yeah. Yeah, so was it kind of like that? Vans? Vans. No, it's got, it's it's not diner feel at all. It's, like, very restaurant. It's, like, where you would go out for a nice dinner in the okay, 50s. Okay, so. Yeah, it's definitely, like. But it's not outdated? They fix it up and remodeled or? Yeah. I think so. Okay. The food isn't diner at all. I'll say that. And it's very like white tablecloth. Okay. Kind of a, so Vans. Kind of a place. So we'll have to go try that. Yeah. So Sam, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Thanks for having me. If someone wants to contact you for Farrier Services, what's the best way to do so? Um, I have a Facebook page. Um, my email is bayareafarrier at gmail.com. Farrier is spelled F-A-R-R-I-E-R. Um, my Instagram is Bay Area Farrier. If you want to DM me, slide in through those DMs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Sam Gubera is my name. So if you want to find me on Facebook too. Great. That's cool. Oh, 510-684-6465 is also my cell if you want to text or call. Perfect. And then we'll link up the website, everything on the description. Cool. Yeah. So thanks for coming out and good luck to the business and, uh, Good luck to future investments in real estate then. Thank you very much. Look forward to it. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Thank you to our producer, Sam Lemon. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the podcast on iTunes, Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Play, SoundCloud, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. For more information on my business as a property manager and real estate team, go visit my website at markguzman.com. I really, really want to thank all of you for listening. It means the world to me, and I hope today's episode provides you value in your day-to-day life. I created this podcast to help showcase the many great people that live in this world and help share some knowledge that I've learned along the way in life. Again, thank you for listening. Check out our sponsors, and I'll catch you on the next episode.